chapter 26. My dear Wormwood, yes, courtship is the time for sowing those seeds which will grow up ten years later into domestic hatred. The enchantment of unsatisfied desire produces results which the humans can be made to mistake for the results of charity. Avail yourself of the ambiguity in the word love. Let them think they have solved by love problems they have in fact only waived or postponed under the influence of the enchantment. While it lasts, you have your chance to foment the problems in secret and render them chronic. The grand problem is that of unselfishness. Note, once again, the admirable work of our philological arm in substituting the negative unselfishness for the enemy's positive charity. Thanks to this, you can, from the very outset, teach a man to surrender benefits not that others may be happy in having them, but that he may be unselfish in foregoing them. That is a great point gained. Another great help, where the parties concerned are male and female, is the divergence of view about unselfishness which we have built up between the sexes. A woman means by unselfishness chiefly taking trouble for others. A man means not giving trouble to others. As a result, a woman who is quite far gone in the enemy's service will make a nuisance of herself on a larger scale than any man except those whom our father has dominated completely. And conversely, a man will live long in the enemy's camp before he undertakes as much spontaneous work to please others as a quite ordinary woman may do every day. Thus, while the woman thinks of doing good offices and the man of respecting other people's rights, each sex, without any obvious unreason, can and does regard the other as radically selfish. On top of these confusions, you can now introduce a few more. The erotic enchantment produces a mutual complacence in which each is really pleased to give in to the wishes of the other. They also know that the enemy demands of them a degree of charity which if attained, would result in similar actions. You must make them establish as a law for their whole married life that degree of mutual self-sacrifice which is at present sprouting naturally out of the enchantment, but which, when the enchantment dies away, they will not have charity enough to enable them to perform. They will not see the trap, since they are under the double blindness of mistaking sexual excitement for charity, and of thinking that the excitement will last. When once a sort of official, legal, or nominal unselfishness has been established as a rule, a rule for the keeping of which their emotional resources have died away and their spiritual resources have not yet grown, the most delightful results follow. In discussing any joint action, it becomes obligatory that A should argue in favor of B's supposed wishes and against his own, while B 
does the opposite. It is often impossible to find out either party's real wishes. With luck, they end by doing something that neither wants. While each feels a glow of self-righteousness and harbors a secret claim to preferential treatment for the unselfishness shown and a secret grudge against the other for the ease with which the sacrifice has been accepted. Later on, you can venture on what may be called the generous conflict illusion. This game is best played with more than two players, in a family with grown-up children, for example. Something quite trivial, like having tea in the garden, is proposed. One member takes care to make it quite clear, though not in so many words, that he would rather not, but is, of course, prepared to do so out of unselfishness. The others instantly withdraw their proposal, ostensibly through their unselfishness, but really because they don't want to be used as a sort of lay figure on which the first speaker practices petty altruisms. But he is not going to be done out by his debauch and unselfishness either. He insists on doing what the others want. They insist on doing what he wants. Passions are aroused. Soon, someone is saying, very well then, I won't have any tea at all. And a real quarrel ensues with bitter resentment on both sides. You see how it is done? If each side had been frankly contending for its own real wish, they would all have kept within the bounds of reason and courtesy. But just because the contention is reversed and each side is fighting the other side's battle, all the bitterness which really flows from thwarted self-righteousness and obstinacy and the accumulated grudges of the last ten years is concealed from them by the nominal or official unselfishness of what they are doing or, at least, held to be excused by it. Each side is, indeed, quite alive to the cheap quality of the adversary's unselfishness and of the false position into which he is trying to force them. But each manages to feel blameless and ill-used itself with no more dishonesty than comes natural to a human. A sensible human once said, if people knew how much ill-feeling unselfishness occasions, it would not be so often recommended from the pulpit. And again, she's the sort of woman who lives for others. You can always tell the others by their hunted expression. All this can be begun even in the period of courtship. A little real selfishness on your patient's part is often of less value in the long run for securing his soul than the first beginnings of that elaborate and self-conscious unselfishness which may one day blossom into the sort of thing I have described. Some degree of mutual falseness, some surprise that the girl does not always notice just how unselfish he is being, can be smuggled in already. Cherish these things and, above all, don't let the young fools notice them. If they notice them, they will be on the road to discovering that love is not enough that charity is needed and not yet achieved, and that no external law can supply its place. I wish Slum Trippet could do something about undermining that young woman's 
sense of the ridiculous. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.